All right, welcome everyone. Welcome to the first session of the Imminence of Truths study group uh, with uh, study groups on psychoanalysis and politics. I'm Daniel Tutt, very pleasure, great pleasure to have you. Um, we'll be meeting for two hours today or longer if we're so inclined. Um, and then in two weeks, we're gonna meet again. Um, and then two weeks after that, two weeks after that. Um, this is extremely uh, exciting for, I think, a lot of reasons. Uh, my book has not arrived in the mail. I hope that others have had the chance to get, you know, the real text uh, in hand and they're not killing their eyes reading the PDF, but most of us have had to do that. That's fine. Um, so uh, I'm really just an organizer here and a participant. I'm here to, to learn, uh, frankly. Um, I'm going to turn it over to John Bova, who is going to be our main discussion leader, and I'd like to read John's bio, um, just to introduce John. Um, John's work is based in mat mathematical dialectic of Plato and Bedieu, and his work is often drawn, drawing on Sartre and Lacan as well. He is a teacher of philosophy at the University of New Mexico. And the it's a researcher, and actually. Okay, researcher, and uh, teaching some capacity, I imagine. John's currently designing an experimental course on philosophy and large cardinal theory, otherwise known as the theory of the higher infinite. Um, and you can check out John's uh, writing, um, including his blog, which is called Minimal Sartre, or you can go to his academia page to look at some of the published articles that he has written. So, just want to say, John has done an immense amount of work to prepare for this, and we should just make him feel comfortable and at ease, because he has a lot to instruct us with. And with that said, thank you, John, so much, and thank you all for being here. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Um, I want to begin, of course, by thanking Daniel and the LGBT for hosting us, and uh, Daniel for, for taking the non-trivial risk of putting this group uh, into the hands of someone he barely knows. I, I shall study deserving. <clears throat> um, and to thank Luca Frazier and Gabriel Supernamba for suggesting it, and SDP for the theoretical practice for their encouragement of the idea. Um, and most importantly, to thank all of you for joining in. Uh, I have overprepared dramatically for my own benefit, uh, and I don't want to just lecture uh, at you for an extended period of time. I would like to try to have a discussion. Uh, I take it that there will be a learning curve in a group this large, um, but I'm hoping that with Daniel's help, uh, we'll be able to eventually come up with something relatively smooth and uh, just be patient with each other in the meantime. Um, we have a wonderful diversity of backgrounds, both in terms of experience with Badu and levels of mathematical engagement. Um, so, speak up, um, please if you can, uh, to the extent that you can make yourself heard by raising your hand anytime something isn't clear, uh, particularly with regards to math. Um, the fact that the math is my focus on this reading does not mean that it has to be yours, of course. Um, in fact, a, uh, a participant has already volunteered uh, to talk about uh, the Blackbird piece that shows up uh, much later in the book, the musical piece. Um, it would be great if others uh, will do something like that as well. Now, all of this is subject to Daniel's guidance. Let's be ruled by him, as uh, Plato Socrates would say. Uh, we should be ruled by those who know. Um, I'll do, oh, wait, I'll do uh, one other ritual disclaimer. I'm not a set theorist. I don't think of myself as a Bedou scholar. Uh, I'm not a completist. I just think about some of the same things uh, that he does. And uh, I would broadly consider myself the Bedusian. The encounter with being an event uh, 15 years or so ago made a space in philosophy for people like me 
who are Platonists by temperament and Sartreans by credo. Uh, so the kind of nuts who would read uh, Plato's Carmides for its existential philosophy and read being a nothingness for its logic. Um, th there, was, there was no space uh, for such people until being an event. And I feel just high on this new book in a way that's reactivating uh, those memories of first having been uh, incorporated into the Adieu events. Of course, I do not speak for him. Uh, we'll just try to figure things out as we go. Let me try to share a screen. Oh, uh, before I do that, um, we were talking about having a conversation, a relatively open conversation about that use philosophy in general, uh, because there are people here with very varying degrees of experience with that. Um, Daniel, do we do we want to do that? We certainly could. Um... If folks, so one thing we were thinking is you all did a survey or like 90% of the people have done a survey. If you haven't done it, I'm going to send a link to do so in the chat. And we thought we would extract some of the kind of basic information about people's background that they shared for the benefit of others to sort of read about others' backgrounds and what their interests are and maybe even, so we want to kind of make that public to this group of 30 so that because we don't quite have the time to quite do that proper deep introduction because we want to preserve the time to actually dig into the stuff dig into the meat as it were the substance so um yeah then we're faced with the question of everybody really knows Baju quite thoroughly in many cases and therefore the question emerges as to is it useful to say some quite general things <laughs> about being in event part three, um, or even Bedju's philosophy as such, um, or even Bedju as a biography, as a, as a, as a thinker. Um, so, you know, we don't really have anything prepared for that, but if folks wanted to sort of jump in and say anything, or even maybe even we could say, John, people can put a, a favorite link in the chat to something about Baju that they that they find interesting perhaps um, that might be one way to 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 do that um, does that make sense John sure and, and to speak up as well sure yeah so I guess the question is if folks wanted to say something general about Baju's philosophy feel free to jump in raise your hand Oh yes, oh, by the way, also for chatting and for discussion, we do the stack method, which is either put your name or put the word stack in the chat, and we'll just go in order. Or people can raise their hand with the hand reaction emoji. Um, I can say something briefly. I just, the sound is very choppy, especially John's. Thanks, Terrence. Okay. It's not too choppy for me. Could somebody chat if John's is choppy as well? Just to confirm. Alpha, beta, gamma, delta, epsilon, beta, beta, beta. Well. Okay. We're getting mixed results. I think it is what it is. We'll have to proceed. Okay. Yeah, you are you are coming in somewhat choppy. Um, maybe maybe if I muted. We've come uh, to the University of New Mexico in order to take advantage of their fast wireless. Uh, I was going to broadcast from home, but uh, this is probably the best that we can do in Albuquerque. How's it doing now? I think it's fine. I mean, it's, it's, it's okay. Okay. Does anyone want to say anything general about that year?
That's a great idea uh, to share Terence's review. So we have six sessions together. That's obviously humanly impossible. Uh, what we have here is a decent chunk of a graduate education in that theory. And that's presuming uh, some of the work that was already done and being an event. So let's try to make a thoughtful start. Uh, if we pretended to be entirely adequate, uh, then today we would want to get through everything under number one, including everyone's questions. Uh, we will fail, but hopefully we will fail interestingly. On my reading this time, uh, there are a number of interventions into the text. Of course, we haven't established what the text says yet. There are a number of interventions into that I'm probably going to make. I list 11 of them here, of which a few, I believe, are going to come up today. Uh, the first one will. I'd like to offer a defense of the form of Badu's propositions. Number three will, uh, ZFC, that's the standard zermelo frankel set theory with the axiom of choice. We should ask about the implications of the fact that ultimately, at the end of the day, even though it's not a finitely axiomatizable uh, formal system, ZFC is a formal system like any other. It's a bunch of inscriptions, uh, a bunch of rules for translating those inscriptions one into another, and you churn out theorems. That is in some tension with the things that we try to say, uh, already going on to number four, uh, when we say something like ZFC is set theory or ZFC is mathematical ontology. Uh, this is not uh, coming from me remotely a criticism of being an event or of this book. Uh, to the contrary, I want to introduce this idea of trying to say uh, in order to establish a principle of dialectical necessity that will start with the very rudiments of the FC and lead by a necessity that, that of course is not formal, uh, but I'll try to earn the claim that it is dialectical all the way to uh, large cardinal theory. Uh, this idea of trying to say is crucial. I'll come back to that uh, in a moment. We may get to uh, part of six today. Number seven, um, I think in a slide, I, one of the slides that I will do is uh, to remind us of Badiou's three orientations of philosophy. Uh, this is extremely important, going all the way back to being an event. Um, what I take to be the major revision in this book is the movement of large cardinal theory from one orientation to another. We'll make that clear in a second. That is not, as far as I know, covered under the self-criticism or the accounts of how this book came to be. Therefore, we have to do a little bit of creative work in order to account for it. And in order, I suggest, to determine what happens to the scheme of the three orientations after that. And the rest of those we will get through today. Here's a general plan of what I was uh, thinking of doing today. The most important thing, however, is, is the conversation, is the interventions uh, and the questions on your part, honestly. Uh, I know there's a tendency in such a large group to sit and remain silent, but please try to fight it. Um, so here's how I was thinking we might proceed. Uh, first time I talk about what a bad using proposition is and the revision of being an event with respect to large cardinals, which is to say uh, the revision of the three orientation. That's at least two Badu in general things um, that I might be able to say that nevertheless are central to the exploration of this book. Then perhaps uh, we could have something like an open discussion of uh, the speculative strategy in which Badu lays out uh, exactly what it says, speculative strategy of this book. 
I threw together a very rough outline at the beginning of it just to remind us uh, there's nothing authoritative about that outline. Then, in my opinion, we should do the essential thing. It's hard to do in this setting. It's much easier to do in person uh, because there we can ask questions and receive answers in a more rapid Socratic fashion. But the essential thing that we should try to do, I believe, is to recollect Conker's theorem. That is the key to everything in this book. It's the key to everything in Badu's philosophy, I would argue. Um, and it's the starting point at each of, in each of the three big books. Uh, I forget whether this is true of theory of the subject, but at, at, in each part of being an event, we begin with an interpretation of Conker's theorem. Following that, I think we'll be in a position to reinterpret the axiom of choice. And then pretty much anything goes uh, from the reading after that. Any, any feedback from Daniel or, or anyone else? Sounds like a solid plan. Okay. What is a Bedusian proposition? Yes, I'm asking. I, I'm, I obviously have a suggestion here, but I'm also asking. We all know that Bedu writes differently from other philosophers in the uh, quote unquote continental tradition, right? And the speculative propositions that he offers us are differently structured. So what makes a Bedusian proposition? What's the characteristic form of a Bedusian proposition? Someone tell me, if you will. John, you have the power to call on people who you know know the answer. Ah. Because we have the survey results, so we know how knowledgeable many of you already are, so don't hide it. Uh, Jim, please. Hi, can you hear me well? I I just thought I would uh, answer just so someone would, but uh, <laughs> um, you asked the general form of a Baduian proposition. Um, I'm not sure if this is what you're we're looking for, but um, generally um, he starts off with some sort of informal um, description of something. Um, and you just kind of have to take his word for it. Um, and it's uh, it often is... Uh, difficult to follow, at least in my experience. Um, <clears throat> and then there is uh, the formal exposition of the same thing, um, which makes you um, understand what he was talking about before. And then for me, I have to go back generally and read the informal description. And then <clears throat> often or not, there's some sort of side discussion about a poem or uh, some kind of uh, discussion of some, you know, other philosopher or something that also demonstrates what he's trying to say. I don't know if that is kind of what you were thinking or. It's quite useful. You, you've reminded us of, uh, of the double exposition, uh, sometimes yeah, yeah. triple, sometimes yeah, triple yeah. exposition uh, that structures uh, Bedu's arguments, but this is such an essential thing. Uh, please go on, Yasha. Yeah, yeah, the only, uh, just what Jim kind of made me think about, there is something he mentions at the beginning, I think in the introduction somewhere about how um, often when you read him, it kind of becomes this like the end is the beginning and the beginning is the end sort of form where you really can't uh, like see the full thing until the end because you've seen it from all these different perspectives. Um, yeah, uh, I don't know if I have anything else, but just want to say that. 
he even has a striking line in this book where he affirms that, right? Um, it's page 26, the third full paragraph. My starting point, which as always in philosophy is also the point that must be demonstrated and justified, et cetera, et cetera. Um, actually, let, let, let's read that. Is that on the one hand, there are truths, i.e. existence that have universal value and significance, recognizable as such, any human subject whatsoever, which doesn't mean that they always are recognized. And that on the other hand, the truth is an imminent production in a particular world. It's not something that has existed from time immemorial in the heaven of ideas. And to, he, he lays out uh, this, well, he, he lays out uh, numerous, characterizations and rephrasings of what the book's thesis is. Uh, but to get back to Yash's point, um, here we have this sort of explicitly not, it, it's not the hermeneutic circle exactly, uh, but it's a new level of, uh, of affirmation that the proof is in the pudding. Yasha? Yeah, I agree. I don't know if I have anything else off the top of my head to uh, add to that, but yeah. Oh, I, I will also say one thing. I do think usually the core, and this is something that's unique to him, the core of the like structure of the proposition, almost like the skeleton, is generally the mathematics. And then there's um, almost like it's almost like the conditions of philosophy act as like the organs around it to give you like the whole body of the work. So maybe that's like a very uh, explicit metaphor there, but. But let me uh, sharpen that to a point that I think captures the dismissal of Badiou's work by many, not quite all, but many professional mathematicians and in the Anglosphere people doing philosophy and mathematics. Um, which in fairness has actually come a long way uh, even since the Eminence of Truth uh, was being composed. But why do people dismiss what Badiou is doing? I think it's because a Badiouian speculative proposition takes the form of something like Matheme, equals or is equivalent to, or is the same as something that is not manifestly mathematical, something that is not phrased in the language of mathematics. We'll call it a non mathy Or perhaps we could call it a philosophy. This structure, um, it poses a problem. And not just a problem from others. I mean, th this is why, uh, this is what inclines mathematicians to dis dismiss what Badiou is doing out of hand. But even for us, uh, surely we have to, th who, who are committed to this project, right? Even for us, we have to think about the possibility of doing what we're doing here and, and pose to ourselves the risk that it could be nonsense. I don't think it's nonsense. Presumably you don't think it's nonsense because you're here. Do you have an account of why you don't think it's nonsense? Are you bothered by this kind of equation? I feel like this gets at the sort of mathematics as metaphor that he uses a lot. Um, and that I think it's meant to like, imply that there's something uh, underneath it's mathematical that maybe our like language can't fully grasp or comprehend, but Chris, go ahead. Hello, uh, the oh, one I, I, I hear you. Chris, before you do, Yasha, I like what you just did there. You noticed that somebody else had their hand up, you called on them. I don't even need to do it. Cool. Please, keep, please keep doing such things. All right, go on. So, the comment I'm going to make is regarding the sort of epistemology approach to understanding Badu, which is how do we know it's true? 
But I don't think Badu ever takes that route out directly. If you recall the opening pages of just being an event, he simply says, we have a decision to make. We're going to make the decision that it's the multiple, not the one. These are the consequences that follow from that decision. Take it or leave it. There's no question that that's what he said at the, at the beginning of being an event. Uh, do you do you take him at his word and do you stop worrying about it at that point? Uh, like again, I would say there's there's no way of knowing in advance a priori whether it's true or false. You just simply accept that he made that decision and these are the consequences. It's at that point your choice. It's undecidable. One thing that uh, that I really want to come back to, I'll just put a bookmark on it, uh, is the relation between uh, decision in that inaugural sense and axiomaticity. Um, it's really worth teasing out uh, what's identical and different uh, between those two. Uh, but we'll come to that uh, at least when we uh, ask what it means that CFC is a formal system, which is to say a, a system of axioms and theorems. Why don't we go to Jonas? <clears throat> Hi. Um, so I guess you said that does it bother you that um, uh, like that there's math on one hand and like poetry on the other? It, it for me, I guess it kind of does. Um, like I don't. Is it is it math to do politics? So I guess that's maybe one of the questions I have. I sort of tentatively accept that there's math associated with this, but I don't, I don't really have any authority on that. I don't know what that, what it means to be math, you know? Um, I hope that makes some sense. Um, like, because if, be, if being is multiple, and then he goes on, uh, well, I'm not sure I can actually speak very coherently right now, but uh, I'm just, I suppose that is maybe the biggest question I have with Badu is, We'll have sections that he's talking about, like set theory and very explicitly about math stuff. And then the next section, I'm not sure where where it fits in. Like what where's the uh, where's the link? I, I don't I don't understand that, I guess. You're in the right place, Jonas. Uh, Levi had a hand, but then it uh, would you like to jump in? Sure. Yeah, I, I was. I was just going to kind of echo um, some of what Chris said as well, especially um, in Baju's book Saint Paul, I, which I think is a wonderful kind of explanation of of how Baju sees truth and truth claims and and how truth relates to politics. In which he says, what's interesting about Paul was, you know, Paul was not there for the the resurrection of Christ. Right? He wasn't there. He wasn't a disciple. He saw nothing, and yet he said. It was true, and the insistence of that truth over and over then lays the, gra lays the groundwork for a kind of politics and ethics. And so I see often when I'm reading Badu as him kind of placing himself in the position of St. Paul, in which he is saying something is true. Here's how we, this is why we say it's true. I'm saying it's true, and then I'm going from there. And I really am interested in that kind of Badusian, I guess I would call it an ethic um, of starting with saying, this is true, an event happened. This is what truth is about for Badu, at least in my interpretation, right? Is that an event did happen and then the event immediately kind of disappears and you have to insist on the happening. And from there, that's the foundation for, for politics, for ethics, for, for other things. All of which consist in the construction of a generic subset of the situation, right? Starting from the affirmation that the event which immediately vanishes has occurred and following faithfully the consequences of the assertion of the existence of the event in relation to uh, all the parts of the situation that you can only encounter aleatorially, right? Uh, you can only encounter them by wandering around a bit and bumping into connections and uh, affirming that they do or don't have a connection with the event. Uh, because if you had a nice concept to decide that in a non-aleatory way, uh, then you would already have a name for the generic subset. It wouldn't be generic anymore, right? Um, 
I would add to this this conversation in a general sense. I've always been drawn to Bedju's notion of a polemical basis of the proposition as wager, as a wager, um, which you know he gets from, in part I think Mallarmé, um, uh, and the theory of chance, and there's a kind of careful. Uh, uh, strange kind of atemporality at work with the with the with the notion that you're sort of declaring something in it and of course the optics of that for a uh, for many maybe mathematicians in particular is for one to to presume a declarative wager it's quite quite a pompous thing to do is it not right and I think in some ways I was once watching Judith Butler tear Alain Badiou to shreds over his reading of Spinoza as a formalist. And she said, you lose the whole affective uh, greatness of Spinoza when you try to formalize Spinoza. And um, he took it pretty well, but he was kind of humiliated in front of a large group of people by Judith Butler. Um, technically, she won um, in that s moment, right? But... Um, but yes, I think, John, maybe the reception of Bedju within mathematical, math, for mathematicians, I'm not sure that a polemical wager-based approach to truth resonates with everyone. That's just a possible idea. I don't know. Sure. When it comes to the mathematicians, he also has this discourse that they are unconscious ontologists. Right? They're not concerned with the meta-ontological thesis that mathematics is ontology. And uh, if you go and bother them about that, they'll just be sort of bemused. Um, the, the experience that I've had at least uh, badly in uh, Anglophone philosophy of mathematics is that the situation is maybe a little worse than that. Uh, that it's not indifference, but it's an objection that any proposition of this form has to be nonsense. Um, and I'm, I'm Coming up on trying an argument out on you guys uh, regarding this, um, but is Jim next? Yeah, hi. I, I just had a quick comment. Um, I guess I would call myself an enthusiast, a Badu enthusiast, um, and uh, even at saying that, um, it's hard for me to say I'm an enthusiast really at anything. But um, there were some things that, um, say, for like in logics of worlds, um, or say in, in being an event. Um, just kind of went with it and um, went with the process, right? In Logics of Worlds, there were a few things where, um, like when he talks about um, transcendental functor being a sheaf, those, the uh, Groten, I'm not sure how you pronounce his name, Grotendieck, uh, Topos, but he literally says a world as a site of being there is a Grotendieck Topos. And for me, that was, um, oh, you know, it was, I just had to kind of take his word for it because um, of all the mathematical concepts, that would probably be the one, the, the ones in logics of worlds were the most difficult for me. But um, I was recently reading a fair amount of Ranciere and running into a lot of similar concepts to things in Badiou, but realizing that the, um, the mathematics in Badiou, which underpins the same, con the same concepts, gives it a kind of a weight that it doesn't have otherwise. And so, um, there's that. That's Certainly. <laughs> uh, I think there's a curious uh, relation between this book uh, and being an event in Logics of Worlds, right? Um, even, for example, in Reinhardt's excellent introduction, which I strongly recommend reading uh, as an outline of this work, um, I think there's uh, some really good exegesis of being an event, um, two or three sentences about Logics of Worlds, and then we come back to the plan of this book. Um, and I, uh, that's, not, uh, that's not a mistake, I don't think. Uh, even though the self-criticism that they do explicitly talks about in this book is the one regarding, is still the one regarding logics of worlds, uh, what we have to account for, I think, is the path between being an event and this book. Um, and just to come back to the Groton Deke thing, I, I'll toss out one fun factoid that we won't be able to understand until next meeting uh, no, uh, thank goodness, our third meeting, um, which is that, as I recall, I hope I don't get this wrong, the existence of a, the, the uh, Grotendieck universe axiom 
which essentially says you can always work inside of a Grundig universe, is equivalent to the affirmation of a proper class, uh, which is to say an absolutely unbounded, uh, inconsistent multiplicity of inaccessible cardinals. Um, that might sound like nonsense at, at the moment. Um, if it doesn't sound like nonsense- Can you say that again? Yes. Okay. Uh, uh, Deke's universe axiom, uh, roughly, you can always work inside a Grotendieck universe, uh, is equivalent, I believe, uh, to affirming the existence of a proper class of inaccessible cardinals. Uh, we're gonna see the weird way that V or the set theoretic universe, I always say that in scare quotes, um, that you think is pretty okay with saying universe here, as long as we understand that, right, it's not a being, it's the place of all possible being. We really need to talk about that. Um, anyway, the weird way that uh, V is structured could you move your camera up slightly for us? How about I move V down? That works. Um, so the weird way that V is structured, you can be asserting the existence of a proper class of things, which is to say all the way up. Uh, of course, there is no all the way up, but that means is that you have inconsistency at the top and you accept everything that doesn't run into inconsistency. Uh, so you can be asserting uh, something that is ostensibly about the whole of V all the way up, even though what you're asserting is defined as large cardinals go at a very low level. Inaccessible cardinals are going to be the first that we meet in this book. They are traditionally the smallest large cardinals that anyone cares about. We should mention worldly cardinals, which are technically smaller than inaccessibles, um, because being a worldly uh, cardinal is the condition for being a model of the FC. We'll come to that uh, again later. Um, all right, how about I uh, try out this argument on you? Many of you have probably heard of the church during cases. That's Alonzo Church, Alan Turing, um, both two of the most important mathematical logicians of 20th century. Turing, the uh, architect of the idea of the Turing machine, which gives us all of modern computers. Um, of course, what Turing was trying to do uh, when he did that was not to uh, provide us with technology, but to provide us with a physical explanation of what Gödel had done in articulating is incompleteness theorem. But we'll come back to that later. Um, can anyone give me a quick loss of the church during business? I don't know if I know this perfectly, and I might get a couple of terms uh, incorrect, but uh, some, something along the lines of uh, everything that is either uh, computable or constructible, that might be a subtle difference is essentially what exists right? um, in, like, in, in like a mathematical world, right? That like you can only affirm existence of things that you can compute or construct. Um, uh, almost like you have to build an algorithm of something. It uh, has to do with not being able to do uh, reductio ad absurdum, right? You can't like prove something from uh, a contradiction. Um, you need like a physical thing. This is close. Does, does Approximately, anyone... I know it's related, but I'm... Exactly, yes. Uh, does anyone want to add to that? Okay, so Church Turing, uh, the thesis on its own, isn't the same as affirming a constructivism, but it's very closely related to drawing the line uh, between the constructive and the non-constructive as Yasha suggested. Uh, so the church Turing thesis takes the informal idea that people had been talking about for some time of an effective computation or an effective procedure or Turing called it a purely mechanical procedure Could you move the camera up slightly? There you go. Yep. So this is an informal idea, right? It just has to do with an ideal of formalization. 
what would it mean to have our mathematics completely formalized? Well, it would mean that a person without any insight could sit there in a room, given sufficient instructions, just with pencil and paper, turning inputs into outputs according to the rules, right? This is the, the idea of a purely mechanical procedure. We're all familiar with it now because we're familiar with computers and programs, but uh, it was a big deal at the time. The church turing thesis amounts to saying this informal philosophical idea of absolute rigor or absolute mechanicity is equivalent to a precisely definable mathematical idea, namely computability by a Turing machine. Now, that's roughly to say uh, something that would be very underwhelming for us these days, that the computable is what computers do. Um, and it's not, uh, it, it's almost universally accepted as a working presupposition. That's not to say that it's not capable of nuance. We might uh, need to tweak a, a little bit with quantum computing. Uh, it would be fun to ask whether uh, quantum computing counts as one of those uh, uh, just slight elaborations of the finite uh, that, that he talks about or whether it amounts to something else. Um, Anyway, you might have to tweak it for quantum computing. There are good arguments that uh, it might even be too broad that uh, the Turing, that Turing computability uh, should be replaced by something like feasibility or something like that. But this is pretty much universally accepted as the right first approximation. Informal idea of pure boring rigor and precise mathematical idea of what can be computed by a Turing machine. Now, there is no possibility of proving this, right? Because it is an equation between a formally defined mathematical entity and something in ordinary language that matters to us philosophically, namely the idea of absolute rigor, right? You can have strong arguments, for the church during phases. And, and in fact, the strongest argument, probably heuristically speaking, is that every other definition that was proposed of an effective uh, procedure turned out to be equivalent uh, to a Turing machine. Uh, so uh, church, uh, as the other person in the thesis, had lambda definability, uh, which came out even a little before Turing. Um, and there was stuff from Gödel about using recursive functions. Um, Maybe the most interesting is actually, for our purposes, maybe the most interesting is actually combinatorial definability, which comes from Sean Finkel and Curry, because, uh, sorry for the name dropping, but because uh, we're going to have to talk about what a combinatorial property is, uh, because large cardinals are characterized by asserting that there are these things that have these combinatorial properties. At any rate, uh, all of these proposed definitions turn out to be equivalent to each other, right? So you have a strong heuristic argument that church Turing is actually correct, that the thesis is true in some philosophical sense, but it is absolutely not susceptible to proof. It would be a category mistake to think that you could prove it uh, because you have an equation between the kinds of things that you can prove on one hand and something philosophical on the other hand. Given that this is almost ubiquitously accepted and is in fact baked into the structure of modern technological life, I suggest that it's a problem for anyone objecting to Badusian propositions to explain why they should be problematic in a way that doesn't sweep up Church Turing as well. It seems to me that in Church Turing, we have at least one example of an equation between a math theme and a philosophy theme that is deeply uncontroversial. And so far, I haven't run into um, very persuasive responses to this argument because most of the time people just wave their hands and say nothing like this could possibly be true or relevant. Mathematics doesn't do that. They're objecting that it's a category mistake to equate uh, two things of these two different kinds. All right, go one step farther. Church Turing defines the computable, or if we assert it, we take it to define the computable. Given that that is the case, 
what ought to be true about the uncomputable? So that it can't be constructed, right? True. Um, do we want to go farther? I don't know. I'm assuming I'm just not sure where. Let me try to sell you two propositions. I, I'm going to suggest that you should buy the first one easily and that you should really make me earn the second one over the course of reading this book. Here are the two propositions. One, it would be very strange if the computable had, if we had a thesis that equated the computable with a philosophical notion, but it was impossible to have a thesis that equated the uncomputable with a philosophical notion. That would be very strange, right? Because they're linked by negation. The fact that they are intimately logically linked by that that they are contradictories of each other suggests that, I mean, we should be able to have a first draft of a concept, even just by negating the content of uh, the philosophical content of the church during basis. Okay, but if that's the case, why doesn't everyone agree about it? And why doesn't everyone talk like Badu, go around making uh, Badusian speculative propositions about the whole realm of the uncomputable and uh, the undecidable and the indiscernible and the generic all the way up through the higher infinite. So second claim, I, I, I think you should buy the first one right away, right? Uh, first one seems inanswerable to me. Uh, it would be very bizarre if the uncomputable didn't have some kind of philosophical interpretation. I would like to sell you the proposition that there's an asymmetry, that they're off dialectically speaking to be an asymmetry between those two interpretations. And this depends a lot on how much you're willing to affirm a dialectic of form and content, how much you're willing to wager, if you like, that it's a law of dialectical thought that not right at the beginning and not because of a certain laxity as often happens in, in contemporary philosophy, but that sooner or later, the content of dialectical thinking is going to rebound on its form. If that's the case, then with Church Turing, we have the fact that we, we, have, we have the computable, right? The computable is, is nice uh, in, some, uh, in some obvious sense, right? It's basis for doing what we can do. It's the servant of instrumental rationality. It might, might even be the form of instrumental rationality, depending on, on who you ask. Um, at any rate, it, it bears on this very nice, compact world of things that are possible for us, right? And the interpretation of the thesis is like that, too. It's one thing. It's nice and compact. It's a Turing machine. It's technology. Henceforth, there will be quantitative differences, but you've got the idea. If you buy the second proposition, not only should there be an interpretation of the uncomputable, and Betty would be our great uh, pioneer in this respect, but it also shouldn't be nice and single and foregroundable in the way that the interpretation of computable is. If you buy that the content of dialectical thought eventually rebounds on its form. Um, and again, you should make me earn that uh, over the course of the book. Remarks, objections? How does that argument bear with you? If you want to take time to think about it. I know I'm being a bit dilatory, um, so maybe it would be just as well to move on to the three orientations and uh, what constitutes, I think, the 
central move of this book that we have to account for. We have a question from Alejo and Chris or comments. Great. Yeah, I'll go first. I, I guess I'm just still trying to chew through this, uh, the way in which the sort of Turing thesis allows you to kind of propose an analogical problem, right? In let's say analytic philosophy, philosophy of mind, whatever you want to call it. Um, and I and I guess I always think of the Turing uh, of the computational thesis or whatever Church Turing thesis as a kind of as being strictly within the math theme. Um, so I'm trying to figure out what is the philosophical proposition that um, is being equated to the math theme. What, what is a non-math theme in the church Turing thesis? Because at least in the way that I, I, you know, I teach it to my undergrad students that are in CS and are gonna go work for Google, right? There's, there's never a, a purely sort of philosophical or, or non-math theme element to the church Turing thesis. I guess the thesis itself would be the non Matthew, is that the kind of analog, analog, analogical sort of move between the Matthew and the non Matthew? Because we're so. Go ahead. Because we're so convinced of the truth of the thesis, and because we've wagered so much on it practically, the other side, that there is a philosophical characterization of the other side, has become, I think, almost invisible to us. Because we accept the equation, right? And if we accept the equation uh, um, unconsciously enough, we regard it no longer as an equation between two things, but just one thing. But the effort to determine what pure rigor or a purely mechanical procedure was. was a philosophical problem with some history to it. It's just that the answer has overwhelmed us so completely that we can no longer see the question. Does that make sense? Sure, yeah, I, I guess I, I still think of it, may, maybe, you know, I have to think of it more in terms of what, what would be the, the, the holy uh, philosophical proposition. Um, and perhaps I, I've sort of naturalized it in some sense. I, I do think to think of it as purely within the math theme, right? You're trying to calculate something where there's you know, a function of natural numbers or whatever the usual example is um, through a Turing machine. A Turing machine can do that or something, right? Which is also comp, comp, you know, a computational sort of math, you know, within the domain of the math theme, let's say. Uh, so I'm, I'm still maybe trying to figure out what is a non-math theme element um, why not say rather that rather than being within the math name, the other side of it is asking about the boundary of the math name from the outside, right? So we had computers in, in the Middle Ages, right? We had people whose job it was to sit there and add and subtract and multiply uh, numbers, heaven help them, um, human computers, right? And they got an input and they produced an output. And in some sense, they were following a rule uh, but they were also clearly quite intelligent. Uh, so how are we going to separate those out? Um, in that sense, it looks to me like you're, one is starting from a mixed or impure notion of calculation and from the outside trying to delimit um, the core of a math theme that doesn't require uh, luck or intelligence or extraneous context or all of those things that are in fact vital to, to, uh, to human calculation, probably to human intelligence in general, right? I, I agree with you though, that, that we should push this farther uh, and I don't expect you to be satisfied uh, with that answer. Let's talk about it more. Um, we have a, a question comment from Lachlan. Hi, is my audio all right, by the way, just before I start? I was, this is related. I was wondering to what extent, I mean, for you and also for Badju, I guess, um, the Church Turing thesis could be considered uh, co compatible with what Badju would call like a logic, a purely logicist conception of mathematics, that it's a, that not, which Badju would maybe say something like, not that mathematics thinks as such, but it's a, it's a rhetoric of formal signs and just signs, whether those two are, a, a synonymous in in some way 
Does that make sense? Ed, you gave a wonderful interview answer um, in one of the first interviews that was available in English uh, with Linda Fraser and Sichen Ho uh, that was appended to their translation of the concept of model. And he made a point that I think remains absolutely crucial. In Baju, it's not a matter of the formalization of dialectic. It's a matter of the dialectic of formalization. So formalization doesn't exist for its own sake or for the sake of being able to capture the philosophy. It exists in order to delimit a thought that is only preliminary until we take the dialectical view from the outside and look at what happens to that thought um, through the destiny and the limits of formalization itself. What happens to that content when its form, um, say that of a, a formal system or an axiomatic system or what have you, is met by um, the dialectical inquiry into its foundations and limits. So I don't think it's a matter for Badiou of saying either mathematics is a thought or the church Turing thesis is true. At least I, I would be disappointed if he, uh, if he thought that was an op opposition. No, 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 he definitely doesn't think that's that's an opposition, but it's whether they're sort of, you know, related in the in 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 some way. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, I think it's a view from inside, view from outside thing. I think it's that on the inside of a formal system, the possible is the computable, right? As the thinkable is the computable. So on the in from the inside, uh, church Turing becomes true, right? From the outside, uh, with the dialectic of formalization with something that is not formalized, but something that happens to formalization and traverses it in some way, uh, there I think we have mathematics as a thought. And that speaks to the need, right, to have this second, uh, this complement to church Turing precisely enabled in order to be able to talk philosophically about uh, the view from the outside, the view that objectifies objectification, if you will, right? The view that computes the limits of computation. What is that? We have to give an interpretation. And Badiou's interpretation is, is not simple, right? It's dynamic. It's the whole process of the truth. And my, my argument was that's not a fault. It's in fact predictable if we believe that there's a rebound of content upon form in dialectic. Uh, because just as the thought of the simple, just as the interpretation of the simple will be simple in church Turing, so the interpretation of uh, of what affects the simple from the outside and is not simple, will not be simple. And if that's correct, um, then I think we have uh, A, an explanation for why it takes the work of all these books uh, to lay out the interpretation of what is not computable or, or what is not constructible. Those aren't exactly the same thing, but we'll get, we'll get to that uh, shortly. Um, but also an invitation to join in, right? It then makes it clear, I think, that a Badiouzian proposition is not something that you have to take or leave in the sense of asserting a creed. Rather, if there is this symmetric asymmetry between the, uh, the niceness of the interpretation of the nice, the simpleness of the interpretation of the simple, and the complexity of the interpretation of the complex, if that exists, um, then it's not going to be a matter of accepting any list of propositions as definitive with respect to the ontology of what is not computable or constructible. Rather, it will take all of these books. And even when you have all of these books, it's not going to be definitive. We're going to have to join in and in a certain sense, take the next step, come to the rescue of the idea that what is not computable or what is not constructible nevertheless exists and can be the basis for truth. Does that make any sense? Am I, am I starting to become more that clear? Was, that was such a good response. That was, thank you so much. Yeah. I have, a, I have another question. Uh, clarifying uh, this dialect you, uh, dialectic you mentioned before, uh, that you, you said something, something like sooner or later, content will always rebound on form, right? So does that have to do with this? Uh, 
I guess like the distance between, right? Like V of like everything that your Axiom system could uh, uh, validate between and, and what can, act, can actually be constructed within it, right? And that you could like constantly have to do this like pushing um, and almost, I don't know. I don't know if this is like implying this in the whole theme of the math theme, philosophy theme equation. If this is implying some sort of like that the content of non-mathematical things like like linguistic concepts or what be it um, are these like infinite uh, unconstructible. Uh, objects that we're trying to bring some like constructible form to or like say what a constructible form for them would be and that might take going beyond what we already have is that like basically, about, so like, basically i just want to affirm yes uh, okay. <laughs> the short answer i think is yes two things uh that i'd like to say about that if we can get to it today as i think we should uh, I think we'll see an example of that uh, in miniature form uh, when we recollect Condor's theorem. Um, I, I, there's no need to, to, uh, to have a big reveal at the end. What I want to show is that Condor's theorem itself, even though it's the beginning of all of this for us, it's something that requires a second attempt to say it. And that second attempt, uh, among many others, uh, is going to be the axiom of choice. Um, I forget what the other thing was. Uh, is it okay if we move on to a reminder about the three orientations and what seems to be the tectonic shift in this book? So just one quick thing, if we can. So John, uh, your computability Turing machine, um, if I could translate that back into Badu, the idea for me is that the state of the situation runs on knowledge, not on truth, as a Turing machine runs on either halt or stop, on off, like the sort of binary system. So in a sense, the state of the situation based on the encyclopedia, which is a gathering of multiples designated by language, doesn't actually account for generic subsets, which is something that eludes it. It's excessive. Um, and so is this sort of where your direction you're going to? Um, and if I think what I'm trying to understand from you is the question you're trying to answer is, why do people who accept formalisms systems like so Merle Frankel set theory don't seem to want to also buy Badu. Uh, it's the case that Badu pushes a formalist system like that to its limits and saying that it doesn't account for the event and that the event is itself the rupture of those systems that needs a subject to actually decide on things that a Turing machine can't decide on. Does that make sense? Broad, broadly, yes. Um, and, and we're clearly speaking in the same environment. Um, we're reading Bezu metallogically or mathematically uh, when, we, when we talk about that. There are a few specific things um, on which I, I think we might differ in that account, but I think it's probably better to let them come up uh, when they do textually. Is that all right for now? Okay. I'm going to see if I can share my screen again. Okay. All right, here's a claim. The main revision in this book has to do with the three orientations of thought that are right at the core of being an event and of the whole project. And so that you're uh, not taking my word for it, I've just typed out the straight up Badusian definitions for these terms uh, that he gives in the dictionary uh, at the end of being an event. So if you don't mind, let's actually read them to recall them to memory. Four definitions. First, the definition of an orientation in thought. He writes, every thought is oriented by a predecision, most often latent, concerning the errancy 
of quantitative excess. Quantitative excess is what's going to be shown in Hodder's theorem when we recall it. The errancy of quantitative excess uh, refers to the independence of the continuum hypothesis, which is actually more of an obsession in being an event and is perhaps not going to play as important a role in the eminence of truths, which would, I think, be all to the good. Um, but more of that later. Uh, we can just take it to be concerning quantitative excess if we want to bring it uh, closer to the environment of the eminence of truth. So every thought is oriented by a predecision, most often latent, concerning, the quanti concerning quantitative excess, as shown in Congress theorem. And there are three, constructivist, transcendent, and generic. I don't think that changes. I think we still have the commitment to there being three. And if anything, we have an even more constant pattern, um, tell me if I'm wrong, in the eminence of truths of making every statement twice, once against the constructivist and once against the ontotheologian or the uh, adherence of the transcendent orientation or what have you. Um, it's even more pervasive, I think, than it was in being an event. Uh, I'm curious about why. I have my ideas about why. But, uh, first, constructivist thought. The constructivist orientation of thought places itself under the jurisdiction of language. It thereby masters the excess of inclusion over belonging, or of parts over elements, this is Cogger's theorem, or of the state of the situation over the situation, we might need to change that, by reducing that excess to the minimum. All right. So constructivism relies on language in order to constrain the consequences of Cogger's theorem, which would otherwise explode into actually interesting ontology. The second line, constructivism is the ontological decision subjacent to any, uh, subjacent, pardon me, to any nominalist thought. You could probably substitute pragmatist or uh, capitalist or technophilic or um, any no, one of a number of other things for nominalists. Um, he's, he's picked one, one term here. Uh, I think you might, uh, I think you might take secular, uh, actually, uh, if you think of that you thought as anti-religious and anti-secular, which I think is a pretty good way to do it. Um, and then the ontological schema for such thought is Gödel's constructible universe. Um, even if we don't know quite what that means yet, uh, that is going to remain an obsessive theme of this book. Uh, the set theoretic universe or the cumulative hierarchy is called V. Gödel's constructible universe is called L. So the question of whether constructivism is uh, ontologically feasible is equivalent to the question, well, can V equal L? Can we interpret the constructible universe as the universe uh, as a whole? I, I was writing that on the board and I forgot that, uh, that you can't see it, but it was V question mark equals L. Uh, does V equal L? Go on to the next slide. Transcendent thought. The orientation of transcendent thought places itself under the idea of a supreme being of transcendent power. It attempts to master the errancy of excess from above by hierarchically sealing off its escape. Right? So constructivism limited itself to what is below. Transcendent thought uh, attempts to master uh, the errancy of excess from above by hierarchically sealing off its escape. It is the theological decision subjacent to metaphysics in the Heideggerian sense of ontotheology. That I think remains 100% the same in this book. Um, you'll, have to, uh, you'll have to tell me if I'm wrong. But here's the crux. In being an event, the ontological schema of such thought is the doctrine of large cardinals. In other words, large cardinals are the mathematical form in which ontotheology is incarnated in being an event. Now, this has to change. The very project of, of this book, uh, which is a reflection on large cardinals, they're the main characters in this book. Um, they are the, uh, the inhabitants, uh, for the most part, of what Bedu calls, uh, has taken to calling the absolute. Uh, we'll have to talk about why. Here we have 
large card in this book we have large cardinals as intrinsic to the proper development of ontology and especially to the thought of the absolute so this is what has changed come back to the question of what has to occupy that place in a moment just notice that right now we have an empty place we don't know what transcendent thought is because its schema has been moved Large cardinals can no longer tell us what transcendent thought is or what ontotheology theology is. Okay. And then, if anything, uh, given the slides that we're seeing now, the large cardinals have just been moved down. They are part of generic thought right now. The generic orientation of thought assumes the errancy of excess, assumes it, take it, takes it up. I don't think that assumes it as in, uh, takes it as a given. Uh, it's the Sartrean use of assumes, right? It takes up as a project. Uh, one must assume one's freedom. One must assume the errancy of excess and admits unnameable or indiscernible parts into being. It affirms the errancy of excess. It even sees in such parts the place of truth. Note the appearance of the term place here, which is uh, going to be so slippery and so decisive in the evidence of truth. For truth is a part indiscernible by language against constructivism, and yet it is not transcendent against ontotheology. That's the, the constant pattern of the, the two enemies, the two opponents, right, uh, in relation to whom uh, truth and being and the subject in that use discourse have to be uh, continually defended. Generic thought is the ontological decision subjacent to any doctrine which attempts to think of truth as a whole in knowledge, uh, roughly what we were uh, very roughly approximating uh, under the heading of the incomputable a few minutes ago. There are traces of such from Plato to Lacan. The ontological schema of such thought is Paul Cohen's theory of generic extensions. Um, and indeed, that won't stop being true here, um, but generic extensions and forcing will no longer be sufficient uh, to maintain uh, the progress of the generic uh, toward the direction of the thought of the absolute. Large cardinals have to move down here, uh, up in status, in order to make that possible. So, what is it that takes the place of the ontological, the theological orientation, or of transcendent thoughts? What do you think so far? Chris suggests imminent exceptions take place. But it's truths that are imminent exceptions, uh, exceptions, pardon me, to the laws of the world in which they appear, right? They appear in these worlds, but they're also exceptions uh, to the laws of these worlds. So it looks to me like imminent exceptions uh, belong in that ever-growing gloss on the generic that not only includes uh, forcing and generic subsets now, but also includes large cardinals. So I think I'm still wondering what now is onto theological thought. I have a suggestion about this. Um, oh, uh, David says taking V as the one. Yeah. So if you took, mm. if you took what Badu is calling here the place of being or V as a being, that would certainly do it. I'm going to suggest as we go um, that there's a natural characterization of that in terms of dialetheism or the embrace of paradox that you see uh, showing up 
Um, and, and this is already in Badu. It's just, it's not in the three orientations, it's in the three negations. Uh, so if you remember, uh, there's classical negation, there's intuitionist negation, but then there's also paraconsistent negation. Intuitionist negation leaves gaps in truth. Paraconsistent negation allows gluts in truth, right? So it allows uh, what Grand Prix called dialethia or true contradictions. This feeds very nicely into the, the love of paradox in, uh, in quote unquote, Kunnan philosophy. Um, right, so that's gonna be my suggestion to restore an improved symmetry in the three orientations. Um, I'm hoping to test that as we go through the book. If there was never any proper symmetry between large cardinals and intuitionism or constructivism. They're not the same kind of thing. Um, and certainly they don't account for, I think, the sort of uh, subterranean alliance that always occurs uh, between the constructivist orientation and the other theological orientation, right? They're not actually opposed to each other so much as they're, uh, as they're a shell game uh, played to keep uh, the thought of the generic out of play. Just, I mean, just, just like Plato Socrates, right? You have the sophists on the side of constructible, but you also have the traditionalists on the side of ontotheology. And they are engaged in a correspondence with each other, even though they officially disagree about anything that creates the tools for condemning uh, Plato Socrates. So I'm gonna try and push that and see if we can make it work. Um, I think we probably ought to recollect Contra's theorem uh, before the disaster of running out of time to do so. I think that would be a disaster. Um, do I have the common consent to go ahead and try and do it? I mean, when I say recollect, I mean recollect. I'm thinking of course, of the model of the geometry lesson in the Mino, right? Uh, you all remember this. Uh, Mino says quite uh, naughtily, I would like it, Socrates, if you would teach you, if you would teach me what you mean when you say uh, that there is no learning, but only recollection. And Socrates is like, well, uh, of course I can't teach it. You, you just ask me to enter into a formal conversation. But I will give you an illustration. And you know, slave, a fact that is uh, not without obvious political connotations, I think, uh, obvious anti-Aristotelian political uh, connotations, I would like to hope. Um, you know, slave becomes the one who remembers, uh, who learns in, in uh, the jargon of Plato Socrates, recollects as if from a previous life, but that part doesn't matter. Uh, simply by being asked questions, uh, the truth of a particular geometric theorem uh, that in a way is a great, uh, uh, great, great, great grand progenitor of Contra's theorem and the diagonal theorems. Um, but I'll, I'll make that point on the Zulip or something like that. Uh, what the slaves recollect is that if you construct a square on the diagonal of a given square, you have one that is twice the area of the square that you started with. Uh, and this turns out to be non-trivial because it involves what today we would call irrational numbers uh, or uh, what the Greeks call irrational magnitudes, uh, incommensurable magnitudes. It, uh, it hooks up to Bedu uh, very clearly in the sense of um, a deficit of names. The irrational or the achreton or the alogon for the Greek um, was a magnitude that you had run out of names uh, to express. And if you go back and, and look at Domino, you'll see that that's literally true of the slave. Uh, it's there in an abbreviated fashion. Uh, the slave just runs out of whole numbers with which to express his guesses uh, about the diagonal, but uh, about the, the side of the double square. But uh, it's in fact perfectly rigorous. We know that if the slave had continued into the rational numbers or what have you, uh, he still would have had a deficit of names. Uh, so uh, the incommensurability of the diagonal is is a first progenitor of this problematic of the unnameable within mathematics uh, that is uh, being continued in Contra's theorem and, uh, and enforcing and up into large cardinal. All right. Would anyone be willing, who has some familiarity with this, 
be willing to be my interlocutor in recollecting Condor's theorem. So I, I, I mean this. I have a crazy idea that any philosopher interested in the kind of stuff that Badu is doing should be able to sit down at any time and just write out this proof themselves, not because they've memorized it, but because you can get the whole thing simply by asking yourself the right questions. And then you can contemplate its meaning, which I think is an infinite task, a task that, that produces all three tomes of being an event and then some. Um, would somebody be willing to be my interlocutor? Julie? That would be fantastic. Thank you. All right. So Contra's theorem. Can you move the camera up slightly, please, before you start? Sure. Yeah. Um, it keeps it keeps falling down. Should be good. Okay. All right, let's try and do this more or less rapid fire. Sure. What's, what's Contra's theorem about? Well, it's about sets, right? Yeah, it's about the difference in size between countable and uncountable infinity. Okay. And uh, that in its most specific form, in its first iteration, right? And the one that uh, most people learn in math class at some point. Uh, I would like to insist, if I may, on learning it in its general form, which is how Bajin usually does it. I don't know what experience he's conceding to in presenting first this goofy inductive form uh, in, in his uh, uh, counter theorem in the finite, and then uh, maybe even worse, producing the, uh, we're going to literally diagonalize out of a lattice of, uh, of infinite strings of real numbers proof that everybody learns in math class. And that raises all kinds of irrelevant problems about whether you can really write out uh, an infinite lattice and all that stuff. Let's prove it in the way that he usually does in the general case. In the general case, what's it about? Uh, it's about the difference between rational numbers and real numbers. Okay. Um, so again, that's the first, the first iteration of it. Oh, okay, um, yeah, sure. So um, in, in general, do you recall? Um, in general, I guess it would be um, about one-to-one -one bijection, right? Yes, between one and one. Oh, sorry, um, between uh, two infinite sets. Yes. So we're asking about um, we're asking, that, oh, sorry, go ahead, please. Is that visible? Yes. Okay. So we're asking about a one to one correspondence or bijection, same thing, between a set. And one thing that I like about the general form is it's completely agnostic between the finite and the infinite, right? If we, if we write out the general form in the right way, we don't have to decide uh, whether we're talking about the finite or the infinite. Maybe it's blunt slightly the polemic against the finite here, but there may turn out to be reasons for doing that anyway. Uh, between a set, finite or infinite, and what's called its power set. So if we would like, we can call our set S, and then we would typically write the power set of S as P of S. Slightly script P if you can pull it off, uh, but uh, I didn't quite care. Don't use the full Weierstrass P, uh, which means something different. Okay, what is the power set, and why might we care about it? Um, the power set is two to the n, right? So if you have n elements in the set, then you're going to have two to the n elements in a power set. Very good. So 
So we count it as two to the n. Materially speaking, what are we counting when we do that? So let's say that I have a baby set right here, which just consists of the elements A, B, and C. Right? Sets are extensional. They're defined by their elements. That's the first thing we learn about them, the axiom of extensionality. Right? If I have some other set T that also contains exactly A, B, and C, then T is equal to S. Very basic notion. In a way, set theory is the study of extensionality, but we can get to that in a moment. So let's say that I have, oh, sorry about that. So let's say that I have this baby set ABC. Then, Power set of S is the set of all subsets of S. My audio went out. Are we still okay? Yeah, okay. Okay. So what's a subset? We can answer by illustration here. We, we don't have to give the general definition right now. Uh, what's the subset of ABC? AB. Sure. Right. So the set AB is a subset of or as Veggie likes to say, and this is perfectly good, is a part of S. And speaking meriologically, right, speaking in terms of parts makes perfect sense. If we take that subset, it's a part of the big thing. The lovely thing about the power set, of course, is that it's not a set of parts in the sense that if you break the set and drop it on the floor, you're only concerned about the parts that you can pick up, right? If that were the case, uh, if I drop S on the floor, then maybe AB winds up in one part and C winds up in another, right? But that's not what we're talking about in the power set. In the power set, we're talking about all possible parts, if you will, all possible ways that the thing can shatter uh, when you drop it on the floor. My friend uh, Mike Ardeline has a very nice interpretation of the power set in terms of the fragility of things, uh, the ways that they can, uh, that they can break up. Um, just checking time. Um, I'm sorry, I uh, blew right through the break. I will try to do better next time. Um, <clears throat> so, right, uh, AB is a perfectly good subset of S here. Now uh, we can get back uh, to Shulamith's two to the N. Uh, we have N elements here, right? N equals three. Let's say that we play a game in which uh, I think of a subset and you have to ask me questions in order to determine which subset I'm thinking of, right? Which piece of the original set. And we'll do it with this baby example in which there are only three pieces. Is, is this too pedestrian for anyone? Works for me. Yeah. Um, right, so how would we play that game? Uh, well, first you ask, is A in the subset? And the answers are yes or no. And then you ask, is B in the subset? And we say yes or no. And then you ask, is C in the subset? Because all these choices are independent of each other, right? So every time you add a new element, uh, things split in two, right? So if you have a subset with three elements, how many possibilities do we have? Two to the third. Two times two times two. Just for the record, what are they? Well, A, B, C, the whole is just one of the parts, as we like to say. Um, and then the ones we're really looking out, A, B, B, C, A, C, then the singletons, A, B, C, and of course, the empty set, which is a subset of every set, right? 
one way of explaining why we do it that way is that we would like to preserve extensionality in the sense that all decisions about set membership are local. If all decisions about set membership are local, no, no, no should be as good an answer to those three questions about, uh, about membership of elements in the subset that I'm thinking of as yes, 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 or yes, no, yes, or anything like that. Uh, so the empty set is immediately a subset of every set, or as, as you like to say, the void is a part of every situation. The void is a part of every multiplicity. Okay. So in asking about the relation of set and power set, we are asking about also the relation between the quantity n, which represents the size of our set, and the quantity 2 to the n. something very interesting in the chat here. Yasha says, two to the n still has meaning for infinite sets, not in the sense of number, but in the sense of counting how many maps are from your set to the two elements that uh, yes, no. Um, agree with the latter, uh, disagree with the former. Um, it winds up defining number uh, in the set, uh, in the case oh, of these sure, infinite sure. sets, number in the sense of cardinality. Uh, so it won't, def uh, I, I know you're familiar with this, it won't define the series of Alephs, but it will define the series of Bess. Um, <clears throat> okay, so again, we're asking about set and power set, which is the same as asking about n and two to the n. And we're asking if they're, if it's possible to equate the two, if they can be equal. Again, why might we care? What, is the, what does this seem to you to be about? Um, to return to the earlier uh, point you were making, it's about the orientation of thought, right? Like, how do we deal with the excess of 2 to the n over m? Sure. If you can, now explain it to a generic middle schooler. Okay. Why, why might we care about these subsets? Um, a political example comes to mind. Right, so okay. if you, for example, have a state, uh, but do use this example in being an event one, right? Then you can imagine the state as like the power set of all the elements that are in a given situation. And then you could reasonably ask, well, is the state just equivalent to what it is meant to be representing, right? Um, yeah. Because some people would say, well, the state, it's just us. It's just us people. There's no one else in the state but us, right? And Badu thinks that actually with the power set axiom, you can demonstrate that the set, the set of the state, the power set, is always going to be in excess of who's in this situation. That's great. Uh, thank you for reminding us of that. Uh, from the sidebar, David, yes, that is essentially what we are proving right now. Um, here's, another, uh, here's another example, uh, epistemological rather than political. Um, so uh, I'm not, no, it's not epistemological, it's epistemic. It has to do with the relation between being and knowledge. Um, notice that when we, uh, when we make a, a claim about something, you can understand it as asserting a relation between an element and a subset, right? So take the set of, mammals. And we'll divide it into two subsets, dogs and non-dogs. These are subsets of our original category, right? Now, if we want to make the very kind of prototypical judgment uh, that is like the minimum for doing philosophy or science or anything else, if we want to say Fido is a dog, It was better than Socrates is mortal. Uh, maybe not. Socrates is mortal is a bane uh, on our existence because when you search for uh, 
specific literature involving Socrates, you get all these uh, useless examples about Socrates being mortal that are just logic and not about Socrates at all. Uh, anyway, if we say Fido is a dog, we can write that any way we want. We could say dog, or even better, is a dog, which has a blank in it, as Frege likes to emphasize, Fido. Or we could just uh, take it down to that. Fido is a dog. The point is, what we're asserting is that an element of the set of mammals belongs to a subset of the set of mammals. So in a certain sense, the most basic uh, operations of knowledge that we have in relation to what there is in relation to being pass through this description of elements to subsets. The very basic Aristotelian S is P, Socrates is mortal, Fido is a dog. So you can also suppose that if there were a totality of being and knowledge, which of course, uh, to speak polemically, is what Hegel means by the absolute, right? Being in itself for itself, an equation of being and knowledge of being, such that there is at the end in the absolute, this correspondence. Suppose there were such a thing, call it God, call it nature, call it Geist, call it the system, what have you. Um, then you would have to have an equation between being and this fragmentation of being that makes knowledge possible. So you can see a metaphysical ideal in the projection of a set that is equal to its own power set. It's like saying uh, an equation between being and knowledge, or to take it up a level between knowledge and self-knowledge, or what have you. It, it's at the core of every ontotheological ideal. The constructivist version is, of course, is don't worry about it. Neither of those are uh, what Bedu is going for, or what we get in Congress there. Okay, so let that suffice for motivation right now. We have political motivation, we have logical motivation, we have metaphysical uh, motivation. Okay, so now we'll just write out the question explicitly. For some set S, doesn't have to be all of them, could be some special set. Can there be a pairing function F that pairs up elements and subsets of S, counts them off together? not leaving any out. So ideally, we would like to see F pairing off elements to subset, element to subset, element to subset. If we can do this, then Hegel's absolute exists, right? Now, if you'll come back with me, I'm here. I would like I would like to demonstrate that we can get the answer to this simply by posing the question with enough intensity and uh, and repetition. So let's do what Socrates would do and draw a picture of the set, power set, and F. Um, how might we do that? Um, set, power set, and S. So we could draw a circle for the set. I like it. Um, then we can draw like a bigger circle that includes and subsumes the first circle for the power set. Ah, but do we know how to do that yet? Probably um, not. All, all we know about the power set right now is that it's a different set. OK. So maybe we'll draw a bigger circle for the power set. OK. We don't want to beg the question against the possibility of their equality, right? So OK, we, sure, fair we enough. Won't, we won't even let ourselves slide psychologically into assuming 
the conclusion that we want to prove. Uh, so like, like those annoying standardized question tests where everything is not drawn to scale so that you have to actually do the math, right? Uh, we'll, do, we'll do it like this, make them roughly the same size. Now, what is F then? How do I draw F? So F would just be an arrow, right? Yes, a two-headed arrow, I would argue, uh, which takes elements of the power set and pairs them off with elements of our original set with nothing being left out, right? This is what we are imagining might be the case. This is our hypothesis for reductio, because it will turn out that this is a contradiction. OK. Does that look like a contradiction right now? I mean, it could be plausible, right? Yeah, I mean, nothing that, that we have drawn seems impossible. If we had a contradiction, it would be nice if it were impossible to even draw it. All right, so have we used all of the information that we have in our statement of the question? Perhaps not. What is the power set after all? Um, it's a set of combinations. Set of subsets, right. Of X, right, of the same set S that we're looking at the elements of, right? Okay, so maybe we can squeeze a little bit more precision out of this and draw S twice instead of drawing S once and the power set of S once. Why not? We'll draw S twice. Now we'll have a function going from S to S, S to S. But if it's got an element on this side, what is it going to have to have on this side? At least uh, two elements. A subset, right? I mean, you can have you can have one element subsets. You can have zero element subsets because we we already proved that the empty set is a subset of every set. But in a generic sense, uh, it has to be some part rather than some element, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I draw a nice kidney bean shaped part there, even though uh, one of the most important lessons of Condor's theorem is that most parts are not nice, and so most parts you can't draw. But to represent it schematically, we'll do that. Okay. Do we have a contradiction yet? So far, so good, right? Because we could still imagine bringing together the elements with the parts. I think you're right. If there is a contradiction, we haven't brought it out yet. Have we used all of the information that we have to condense the problem even farther towards a contradiction? Not yet. It's not. Yeah. After all, we have S twice, right? We've drawn S twice. What if we only draw it once? Right. So here's S, and here's some element X in S. I'll move it up slightly. Here's some element X in S. And S is now going to be a loopy function between S and itself, right? But if we still, it's still the case that if we have an element, a point on this one end of S, we still need a subset or a part on the other end, right? Okay, we draw that in. There's this part, and we can label this part f of x, or the part that corresponds with x. But wait, did I draw it correctly? Well, there's an issue, right? Because the set doesn't both include the element and its own subset. Would you say that again for me? Uh, may maybe I'm getting this wrong, but um, the set wouldn't include both the element and the subset that is the element. Um, right, so we can imagine this being full of other elements. And, and if you like put a little dotted line around there, you're exactly right. It doesn't contain it in the same sense. Uh, we say that X is an element of S and that F of X here is a subset of X. But the fact that they're, um, 
pieces of the same object um, means that in some sense, we should be able to leave the object drawn once and put the, put the arrow uh, between the object and itself uh, in Hegelian fashion, as long as we draw this distinction between elements and subsets. But up till now, I've only drawn what was necessary and sufficient to express the problem, right? Here, I made a choice that I was not justified in making. Here, I drew X as though it were outside of its partner, F of X. Well, why should that be? Why wouldn't it be just as well that X should lie on the inside of its partner, F of X? Just by turning the question into a diagram, we've come to this fork in the road. We have an alternative facing us, which was not obvious in the statement of the original problem. It did not seem to be what the original problem was about. The original problem was about sets and subsets. This is a problem about self-membership, and it's akin to any of a number of problems about self-reference. What do you do when you reach a fork in the road? You take it. So still assuming that F exists, now there are going to be two types of elements, X in S. Those that are elements of their paired subset and those that aren't. Okay, so we'll have cases, maybe none, but in principle we have cases in which X is an element of the subset that is paired with in S, X, and we'll have cases, maybe none, but in principle we have cases in which X lies outside the subset that it's paired with, F of X in S, uh, just the way uh, that I drew it the first time when I didn't have any justification in doing it. So the true diagram, if you like, is the one that has split here. We didn't program that in. We just drew all the information that there was in the problem. The diagram splits on its own into these two cases about self-membership and non-self-membership. Um, you probably know uh, there's an analog known as uh, Grelling's paradox, um, which has to do with words in English, right? Uh, and, and other languages. Um, so uh, some words in English describe themselves, right? Polysyllabic is polysyllabic. Some words in English don't describe themselves. Monosyllabic is definitely not monosyllabic. So we have a distinction uh, parallel to this one. Uh, we have a map and we have uh, points that are mapped to a subset, in Grelin's case, a subset of language, other words, um, in such a way that either they lie inside themselves or outside themselves. Grelin's paradox, uh, we'll give the name for that in a minute. All right, we have these two choices. Now we make the move of gathering up these two kinds of points into their own subsets, right? Because these two different kinds of points should split S. It should split S into the set of points that lie inside their paired subsets and the set of points that lie outside their paired subsets. The self-containing and the not self-containing, the reflexive and the irreflexive. Um, Agamben somewhere uh, tries to make the analogy that the set of all sets that are not members of themselves is language. I think it might be uh, slightly better to say the in itself for itself, uh, the in itself and the for itself, or even better, as I do doesn't being an event, uh, to say a natural situation, which doesn't contain itself, and a historical situation, which always contains itself in the sense of having some idea of itself, some ideology, some way of representing itself to itself. Okay. You look at this one. 
the set of all sets, uh, the uh, set of all X that are uh, paired by F with a subset that they are not a member of. That makes a perfectly good subset. We call it D. Call it D for diagonal, not PA for paradox, terrible idea. So let D equal the set of all X in S such that F of X such that X is not an element of F of X. D is a perfectly good subset. D is a subset of S. So on our presumption that all the subsets have partners, D needs a partner. Call that little d. So that by hypothesis, f of little d equals big d. Now, just by isolating this half of the bifurcation into which our diagram led us of its own accord, we didn't have to think to ask that question. The diagram led us there as soon as we caught ourselves doing drawing something contingent that is something necessary. We've now thematized this half, right? The D half instead of the not D half of S. And the D half is the set of all uh, non self membered uh, subsets. Okay. We still haven't done anything that goes beyond a precising of the original question, and neither does the last step. All you have to do to prove the theorem is then ask, is little d an element of big D? Suppose it is. All right. Little d is an element of big D. D, by definition, is the set of all X in S. Sorry, John, can you, uh, can you write the definition of little d on the corner? The definition of li little d? Oh, yes. Yeah. Um, little d is um, whatever is, whatever element of S is paired with big D by S. So by definition, uh, in fact, I'll put it here. Uh, by definition, F of little d, which is an element, is big D, which is a subset. Does that make sense? Yes, yes. I just wanted the definition to be on the board. Thank you. So D, by definition, right, is the set of all X in S such that X is not in F of X. Right? So, F of D equals D. So D needs to have this property, the property that defines big D. So D is not an element of D, all right? Now we have the D is an element of D and D is not an element of D contradiction. Okay, so we go over to the other side. Suppose no, suppose little D is not an element of big D. The reasoning is the same. Big D is still the set of all X such that X is not an element of F of X. Well, now by hypothesis, little d meets this criterion. Uh, 
And since it meets the criterion for membership in big D, well, then clearly little d belongs to big D. So again, we have D is and is not, uh, little d is and is not an element of big D. Badu calls it um, a, a circulation that happens uh, under the hypothesis that there is a world uh, in which F is possible. Uh, then you get S divided into D and the complement of D. And you have this element, little d, such that if it's inside, it ought to be outside. And if it's outside, it ought to be inside. This is the kind of thing that, that uh, deconstruction sometimes self-consciously exploited in order to make the undecidable its pivotal, comment, uh, its pivotal concept. But Badu does not stop there. The undecidable only exists within the world in which we assumed that there is such a thing as F, which means, if you like, that Derrida is parasitic upon Hegel. Only on the assumption that there is being in itself for itself is there the undecidable. We can reject that assumption. So what we find then is that on pain of contradiction, F does not exist. So whether uh, our original set is finite or infinite, the power set of S, which remember uh, is two to the size of S, is greater than S itself. Thus the infinite is no longer one. We can no longer imagine that there is one infinite that at the same time that it differs absolutely from all finite things, manages to absorb all difference into itself and neutralize it. We cannot imagine, uh, for instance, that infinity would be sufficient to make a being uh, have exhaustive knowledge of everything, including itself. Um, as you and uh, Patrick Grimm come to exactly the same conclusion about this. This is an atheological theorem. Yeah, I, I think that is absolutely amazing. Um, and it makes, I, I think it should humble us uh, to ask what it is that, that we're able to do metaphysics in the wake of Kantar. Uh, as opposed to during that interval um, in which one could imagine the one all or the totality of everything, whether we call the God, nature, spirit system, uh, whatever you like. Um, if you'll give me, uh, if you have to go, that's fine. Uh, if you'll give me uh, just a couple of minutes, I'll make the one point about the axiom of choice and then I'll stop and uh, resolve to begin next time uh, with a more open discussion before I jump into uh, the constructible and the generic and what have you. Um, so there's one point that I want to make about this. We've just done something sort of heroic and tragic and definitive, right? Uh, all of these metaphysical consequences flowed from the articulation of Andres theorem, the proof of Andres theorem. I submit, however, that we need to come to the aid of Contra's theorem a second time. The Contra's theorem is supposed to be about the power set. I'll just state this and, and I'll, I'll pick it up next time. Uh, it wouldn't be fair to keep uh, people for much longer. I'll just state this. The most important of the axioms of set theory, if you, if you can speak, the most singular of the axioms of set theory for Badiou, um, he gets to this a, a number of pages into the formal exposition of the absolute place, is what's called the axiom of choice. And probably those of you who have read Being an Event are familiar with the bold 
proposition, uh, uh, speculative proposition by which that you connect this formalism with an existential and aleatory idea of choice. The point that I want to make to connect this to the large cardinals inquiry in the imminence of truth, and, and I'll, I'll demonstrate it uh, next time, I'll just show it now, I'll, I'll just state it now, is that the axiom of choice, in addition to whether you believe that it has something to do with choice in an existential sense, in addition to all of that, can and must be read as a second attempt to affirm what we were trying to say. There's, there's that motif that I'm going to keep harping on as, as a key to the development of large cardinal theory, to affirm what we were trying to say when we said that the power set includes all the subsets of that. And I promised I wouldn't explain that now, so allow me to leave it as a puzzle, if you will. Why should this be true? Why should it be the case that the axiom of choice is a second sailing, if you will, uh, in the effort to say that the power set exists. And then, which is even more important, why on earth would the power set suffer from that kind of weakness? I mean, didn't it just kill God? How does it need a second attempt? How does it need our help? How does it need us to come to the aid of it in order to affirm it a second time? I think if we can answer that, and it's actually not a terribly hard puzzle, but it's, but it's really worth thinking about. If we can answer that, then I think we'll have the dialectical engine of trying to say that propels us all the way up the large cardinal hierarchy and explains why we can't even stop with the ontology of being an event, which is the FC. Um, right, so all of the apologies for, uh, for stammering and speaking too long and uh, uh, we can talk about the puzzle on Zulip. Um, please do hit me up on Zulip and on any of those other forms of chat. You have all of my contact information in the shared Google Drive folder. And I mean it uh, when you have thoughts and questions about the math or just when chat about the do or whatever. Um, that's what I'm here for uh, during the 12 weeks of this group. I don't want anyone uh, to be left in the dark. <laughs> about these things. Um, they are, when you get down to them, simple and beautiful, and Bedu has pulled off um, a miracle of exegesis in the eminence of truths in bringing these concepts, if you were, down to the level of finite intellect. Um, it's an incredible act of generosity and one that is not usually found in mathematics. So if we just help each other a little bit, we will be able, uh, we'll be able to recollect on the basis of the work that he has done for us, all the way up to uh, elementary embeddings into the. So I stop here. Sounds great. Please join me in uh, giving a positive emoji or a nice comment to our, to our teacher here. John, this has been great. Uh, we look forward to meeting again. Everyone should have access to the Zulip. Sorry to give you another app to use, uh, but it's a good one. Please use it. Please uh, post questions, thoughts, comments there. Um, and John is also available via email, but Zulip is preferable. So thank or, you. Or chat, Google chat or Signal or WhatsApp or whatever. Uh, all of those are... All of those are quite fine, and I'm happy to stay here for a while. Um, we have uh, we had a number of hands up. Uh, Daniel, if you want to, you can just leave the meeting going, uh, and I'll sure. end it. I'll end it uh, when yeah. people don't have anything. Yeah, left I got to make it myself. But thank you all very much. I'll leave it going, and you can close it down, John, because you're the co-host. I'm, I'm going to make you the host, okay. so, so that you can actually close it down as you wish. Thanks for doing this, Daniel.
Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Daniel. One dry erase marker is the casualty list for the day. That's not too bad. Oh. I have no, no other plan. Professor Shu, I'm going to ask a question. Was someone speaking? I, I, I wasn't sure. Oh, sorry. I was just saying if one of you wants to ask a question, keep it a stack. You or Chris. Oh. OK. Um, I feel like I've been talking a lot already today, but um, I did have a question. Um, so if, if that's OK with people, um, then I'll just ask, I guess. Um, Thank you for talking. It's been to everyone's benefit. OK. Um, so yeah. This is actually a question about the ontotheology bit. Um, this is something that has confused me a lot about uh, Jews reading of the history of Western metaphysics. Um, in particular, I think he reads Spinoza in kind of a weird way. Like, it seems odd to me to claim that Spinoza's God is the, the numerical one, right? Spinoza spends an enormous amount of time saying that his God is not the number one, right? Um, so it just, it seems strange to claim that um, what we're refuting when we refute the one is the numerical one, right? Because clearly what we're talking about in the case of ontotheology is a oneness without number, right? Which, uh, would you tell me which version of one it is uh, that Spinoza is denying he's talking about? Do you mean the one of one, two, three? Well, I mean, like when you're thinking of, um, like for example, the letter on the infinite, right? Is the, the one that comes to mind here. And I think that's letter 12. Um, and sorry, this is like a random excursus on Spinoza, but um yeah like when you're thinking about that letter one of the things that spinoza says and he's very clear about it is that like people you know when they think about the infinite they tend to think about it as a numerical concept right so the infinite is something that you know we can count or as we just demonstrated perhaps not count um but uh you know, then he says, well, that's not really what I'm talking about here. What I'm talking about is the absolutely infinite, right? What, what Cantor called Omega. And Omega, I think, is a, perhaps of a different kind than, than what we're talking about here. So I know that, that there's certain issues to do with um, the way that Cantor conceptualizes Omega and the way that uh, you know, this, this is maybe even connected to his mental illness by some people. Some people think that he was just delusional and that he couldn't quite like fix the problem between, you know, having a certain confessional faith on the one hand and this kind of mathematical discovery on the other. Um, yeah, I just wanted to ask about that. First of all, uh, anyone who's actually a good re reader of Spinoza, which not me, uh, should feel free to speak up. I would um, point out, oh, maybe right. just one. sorry, I'll just be really brief. Uh, in the text of Eminence of Truths, I think uh, Badu sort of addresses the issue of Spinoza differently this time in what he refers to as the causal chain of uh, cause and effect. And where does the actual interruption of something ever happen if things, if you understand the effects of something by understanding its cause. And it's this sort of uh, limiting factor of what is infinite as opposed to say numerical. Does that, that makes sense? I would offer that maybe as a direction to look at. We have, um, we have also this explicit discussion of 
Spinoza, right? These two points of Spinoza that we're going to affirm and these two points of Spinoza that we're going to reject. Uh, do you remember reading that? Yeah, um, I think it's on page like 42, right? Is that right? Thank you, yes, 42 to 43. Yeah, and he quotes uh, 1, 1 P15 um, from ethics. Whatever is is in God, and nothing can be or be conceived without God. And again, like this is one of those strange moments where um, the Jew is reading this God as a one, and he says, "Well, you know, it's all good, but it's not a one." And mm -hmm. it just seems like an odd objection because really, what Spinoza is talking about, it seems to me, is the causa sui. Again, maybe I'm wrong, right? Like maybe I'm misunderstanding, but it seems like this is the causa sui. I think I am right with you that it is the cause of sui, but I don't understand how the cause of sui isn't a one-all of the kind that can no longer stand after concert. Well, isn't the cause of sui just a self-causation? Granted. Like, well, how would self-causation have to do with oneness? Okay, yeah, that's a great question. I need to earn that. Um, in particular, I. I need to earn, uh, which I can't do on the spot, um, the association of uh, the loop of causa sui uh, with the automorphism app um, that we were just talking about. I've gotten used to thinking of those as the same thing, but I should actually go back and see if that's even justifiable with respect to another. I, I got used to it because of SART, uh, when SART um, talks about and when he talks about the in itself for itself uh, in being in nothingness, he's talking about exactly the same thing. Um, and it's a question of the, uh, yeah, he's, he's talking about exactly the same thing. I might be able to make a little bit of progress um, with respect to the three orientations and the crazy chart, uh, crazy draft chart that I sent out to all of you guys. Um, somewhere toward the bottom of that, I make the suggestion that once we've revised the three orientations to put dialetheism or the love of paradox in the place of the other theological orientation, now that large cardinals are out, that you can interpret the three of them rather straightforwardly, not just as stances on the infinite and not just as parallel stances on negation, but also as parallel stances on self-reference. If the analogy holds, I think the constructivists have to say there is no self-reference. Self-reference is an illusion. The onto the illusion has to say self-reference is actual. It's not an exception. It is. And the friend of the generic orientation has to say we're it it is, it takes place, but it's an exception in some way, right? This is exactly what that use says in the structure of the event. So I don't want you to let me get away with anything. Um, quite the contrary. But what if I tried to say that there, the, the, if you accept that extension of the table, then the identification of the causal sui with substance is clearly a sign of making self-reference ontological. Yeah, I mean, it, you're right that clearly it is for Spinoza an ontology. Um, maybe we should take this off of the call so that we're not uh, taking up too much time from other people. But I am, I am really interested in hearing more from you, John Upness. Thank you. Fair enough. And, and uh, I would just like to learn uh, how to think about this. Um, from you because I'm not a, a careful reader of Spinoza. Uh, so yeah, by all means, let's talk about it further. Uh, there's an interesting part in 156 of Eminence of Truth, which actually sort of touches on this problem of why is God infinite? Why is God the infinite cause of all things? Um, and for one of the things that Badu is also warring against with this declaration, the one is not, is also a notion of consistency to everything. 
that everything belongs to everything, everything is included in everything, which is a definition of nature he gives in being an event. And for Spinoza, God or nature sort of falls under that purview, whether it's not necessarily some sort of numerical thing, but it's a, a consistency issue, which is why Badu often says biontology is inconsistent multiplicity. It's a multiplicity that cannot be deferred to some sort of atomic structure, some sort of matter, substance, uh, anything that unifies the universe, any sort of fabric of reality that holds everything together. And I think in Spinoza, you definitely get that with God or nature because God causes everything. God is in that sense. So I'll just say that. And that, that was on 156 to find out more about that relationship. I was a little shocked, in fact, to find out that Spinoza is uh, the guiding light here for talking about uh, the attributes of the absolute, right? That he's going to associate with the largest of large cardinals. Um, I didn't see that coming. <laughs> it came as, as something of a shock to me and not necessarily a pleasant one. I have not yet converted to the side of Spinoza. Um, but uh, yeah, he's, there seems to be a strong wager that the Spinozistic absolute is more like the, at least when, it, when it's been properly purged, right? Let me take the two propositions of Spinoza that we're going to reject. It, and this is fair. He, he has just as selective a reading of Plato, and, and so do I. Um, it's not surprising, right, that there's something also theological in both of those thinkers because there's something also theological in everybody at that point. What's surprising is that they managed to think something that tips over the edge and does something different uh, than, than onto theology. Um, but I'll put the question back to, back to you both. V is a place of all being, right? And if he were to think it as a being, it would be inconsistent. Uh, that's so the, the, the V question is interesting to me because he, one obviously says it's a class of places. It's not a set proper because that would give it an effect of being, um, but that it's also a possibility of, I think, I think he very is explicit in saying that it has to be a possibility of, of sets, not that there any set goes. Isn't that, did you read that that way as well? So there's a there's a limitation in B itself before there ever is just anything goes. Um, I was just wondering if you read it that way. Yeah, the, the limitation of consistency itself, right? Um, but I'm not sure that that he doesn't equivocate a little bit on this. V it, and this is a real problem. It, I don't mean a, a real problem with the text. I mean this is a real philosophical problem. Um, do we have a way of thinking V? just right on the edge of inconsistency without having to fall over into one side or the other, right? That's the, that's if you like uh, the new test of the, of the possibility of the third orientation. Can we talk about V coherently without falling into either paradox or constructivism, uh, assuming that you'll allow the revision of the theological orientation to, uh, to a love of paradox. Um, can, uh, if there's anyone who can help us any more uh, with regard to Spinoza um, or the purged Spinoza that we seem to get uh, from Badu, um, certainly please let us know and, uh, and let's continue that on the Zulip as well. Um, I'm here with my colleague Zach, uh, who also has something to say. Can you hear him? No, right now, no. Okay, just a second. So the, have you got me there? Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I just had a question about um, the parallels you're making about the form of judgment when you were discussing the case of Fido as a dog. And so, so what, um, struck me as unusual about that is why you need um, why why you need the language of subset there at all. So your claim was that when we're saying Fido is a dog, we're implicitly saying that some mammal is a dog. Does that mean that um, that you're committing to an ontology where all entities are already typed? If you know what I mean? Or what what's the commitment? I didn't quite understand that. 
um, it would be really useful to give a good answer <laughs> to that question. Um, if you'll allow me to get away with just putting up a signpost or two. Yeah. Um, so I don't mean uh, to say, I, I don't mean to commit to straight up existentialism about properties. Um, quite the contrary. If we were to develop this in a slightly different way, the hypothesis that F exists, the hypothesis that we're working in the F world is equivalent, um, I think, to Frege's basic law five or to the schema of truth as a correspondence between intentions and extensions. I think that's so, uh, uh, sorry, that we could, um, that's probably too rich of an answer that I needed. I, I guess I was just wondering why, so if I was a dog, right, so, um, sorry, could you, could you start that remark? Yes. Okay, I got it back on. Um, I think that's, um, I think that's probably too rich of an answer that I need. I guess I was just wondering why, if you want to give a semantic analysis of Fido as a dog, why do you, why would one need to talk of mammals at all? Like, like that, that's kind of not the core of my question. Do you mean, why not just divide being as the Eliadic stranger would? Let's just divide being in half into dogs and non-dogs. Uh, sure. Yeah. That would, that, well, that would be one option, I guess. Yeah. So maybe just saying that option. I got an affirmative answer there. Um, right. So We, we just play out that with exactly the same form. It's, it's diagonalization again, uh, but we should start it from the Russell side, the side of Russell's paradox. Now, Russell's paradox is not Russell's and it's not a paradox. It's just a direct corollary of Contra's theorem, namely that there is no set of all sets. But um, we can take that as, we can take as the hypothesis for reductio that we can divide all of being straight down the center. Um, let's work out when we have a moment why that's equivalent uh, to F. It's not equivalent to what we're operating on um, by F, which is something tamer. Um, you're exactly right. And the, uh, the tamer version of, uh, what would you like to call it? Of, of the judgment of predication, uh, those tamer versions are the ones that are going to be left in place when the dust settles uh, after we no longer believe in F um, as the axiom of separation. Uh, so when we do it um, with sets from the very beginning, the contradiction moves around a little bit. It's not directly a contradiction in the division of being with respect to every predicate. There, it's a, a here it's a contradiction with respect to the division of being straight down the center with respect to the privileged predicates, self-belonging and self-excluding. But because those are logically linked to the possibility of predication at all, as the argument showed, it amounts to the same thing. Okay. It, it's more direct though, if we, if we start with Russell's paradox and we treat it indeed as a problem about infinite negation or, or indefinite negation. Why can't we think of the non-dogs uh, plus the dogs as forming simply the whole of being? Why do we need to work inside a set? Um, and of course the answer is, is exactly concerts, right? right? Yeah, because yeah. there is no ultimate set to work inside of. Yeah. It's just the, yeah, re I, the I, reasons I, are rearranged slightly. Hi, I was uh, wondering if you could just kind of unpick the relationship for Badiou between math and logic. And like, because I, I never read Logic World and I understand that's where he does his treatment of logic. And so I'm kind of interested in how that kind of fits in. And, and presumably the kind of the constructivist orientation is a kind of logicist paradigm, right? Pre predominantly. He's thinking yeah. of like Russell and Wittgenstein. So, so yeah, how does that I, work? And, and obviously self-reference there, obviously 
has its own unique quirks, right? I can think of a couple of um, signposts to throw out immediately about that. Um, and uh, I really think we should hang on to that question in the course of reading the book. Uh, one thing I'm afraid of, by the way, in talking about the book is that I'm going to be mistaken for a logicist or someone who, right. uh, who thinks that logic is, is uh, prior to mathematics. Um, and please accept my uh, profession of faith that could not be farther from the truth. Um, like Badu, I think logic is just a part of mathematics. But sometimes it's useful to use logical language precisely to show that fact. Sometimes it's useful to use logical language precisely to show the failure of, uh, of logical systems to really maintain their independence from what's, what they say, what is supposed to be the mathematical content. Uh, so we're back to the form content uh, thing in dialectic again. Um, as you reject logicism, he's going to continue to reject logicism. Um, the project of uh, logics of worlds was to show basically how a logic can emerge granularly, locally from uh, prior set theoretic considerations. Other people who use Topos theory and category theory don't go that route. You don't necessarily have to, um, but that's how he takes it, right? He, he, he still wants to hang on to the idea uh, that ontology is set theoretic, non-relational, and uh, stuff having to do with categories, including logic, which is things of essentially category theoretic notion, um, supervenes on that. We forget about the extensional set theoretic layer, uh, but it's important that it's still there for him. Um, so uh, I lost, I, sorry, I lost track of where <laughs> I was going with that. Yeah, it's useful, yeah. I mean, it'd be, it'd be interesting to kind of uh, to pick it up maybe when we've gone a bit further. Yeah, and, and there, there is no, um, as far as I can tell, there is no new logic here. And that's something that I'm hoping to supplement um, because mm. there's a very natural correspondence between large cardinals and what are sometimes called strong logics or infinitary logics uh, to the point where I think we can really uh, get even more familiar and intimate with these strange creatures, the large cardinals, if we allow some of that infinitary logical characterization without being under the mistaken impression that we're thereby reducing anything to logic. All we're doing is using uh, logical tools to express actually what's uh, interactable and, uh, and remarkable about the large cardinals. Um, There's an interesting book actually. There's a guy called, um... Paul Livingston, and he's like a Wittgensteinian. I don't know if you've heard of him. And he takes the, the kind of three orientations that Badu produces and then kind of rewrites them so they're kind of oriented around uh, Gödel completeness, basically, or incompleteness. Um, so any kind of full system either having to be consistent on a kind of granular local level or incomplete, right? And so he creates a fourth orientation, which he calls the paradoxico critical orientation, which essentially kind of maintains the constructivist orientation. But then it, you know, the, the actual practice of critique itself is, you know, uh, revealing how any complete system, you know, will inevitably produce paradox, right? Any, any system that's sufficiently complex, which states itself as complete, and so you can use it as like a form of critique for legal systems. B essentially uses it to kind of save Wittgenstein and interestingly like early Deleuze and Derrida and some Agamben as well, who he all sees as like paradox co-critics. So it's an interesting kind of read from like the other side. I, I, well, I read the first long chapter, which is all you need really, but... Um, He's quite hostile to Bajou, but obviously Bajou is kind of the center of the project at the same time. Oh, yeah, I would say Paul's trying to carve out space relative to Oh, you're, you're aware of him then? Oh, okay, interesting. And we've been arguing about this for about 17 years, yeah. Um, wow. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. So how was, my, how was my brief rundown of his book? Oh, that, was, that was great. Uh, so, I mean, uh, exactly. 
in terms of a diagram um, that we have in common, but Paul has put to different uses uh, than mine, um, you get this intersection diagram, right? Where you pass through the Cantorian moment and there are pre-Cantorian versions of right. constructivism and metaphysics. And then there are post-Cantorian versions where Paul claims uh, that you have a choice in a freer sense than I would mean choice uh, between affirming consistent incompleteness and affirming incomplete consistency. Um, of course, uh, the idea of a duality there is exactly right. And that's where I uh, center myself as well. Um, I, I think uh, well, we could go back into the history of, of a metallurgical or metamathematical reading of Bedu. But uh, one thing that I actually hope to intervene in, and I'm glad that it won't just be talking to myself uh, in this group, is to try to characterize more clearly what it is that gets dualized. I don't think we speak carefully enough when we speak of a duality of consistency and completeness. And the, uh, the way that we get Badu on one side and something else on the other side uh, that can be associated with Deleuze or Lacan or Derrida or heaven help us Wittgenstein um, is symptomatic, I think, of not having quite right what it is that gets dualized. Um, th this won't be, I, I don't think, immediately transparent at first, but there's also no reason for me to make a big reveal of it later. Um, I think the mistake is in failing to realize that what's dualized is always a relation between truth and a modal operator. Or if you like, what's always dualized is a relation between the classical and one of the other orientations. The classical is a fixed point of that dualization. So the classical stays where it is while uh, constructivism rotates into paraconsistency and back again. But that's a duality of two mistakes. It's not a duality of two equally valid choices about how to proceed ontologically. Um, so I, I wanna dig back behind uh, uh, the presumption that we can kind of flip a coin between, which does not do justice to both positions, uh, that we can sort of flip a coin between uh, uh, consistency and completeness and place ourselves on the kind of, on the side of completeness. I also think there, there are just good independent arguments, um, including some psychoanalytic ones against, uh, against thinking that we can do that, that we can opt to, as it were, put thought on the side of the big other and start from completeness uh, rather than, uh, starting from something more modest where we are. Uh, there was an interesting positive. review that I saw, which um, kind of uh, just noted, and I didn't really follow up on it, but that the, the kind of pre-Cantorian orientations map the Lacanian male, the left side of the sexuation formula, which I thought was interesting. But then it's like, what happens on the other side, right? Like, you know, can you get the not all like from Vajou? Maybe <laughs> is Bajou the not all? I I know so many people who have, have been tortured by this question, and uh, I, I almost just want to let others discuss it. I'm not I'm not qualified to, in the end, uh, speak about the formulas of Nicol D, um, or to to give. I I thought that that Lacanian square of opposition means so many different things over the years, and I just don't know, and I've, I've stopped trying to figure it out. Yeah. But somebody, somebody smarter than I can do that. There's books written on it now, like so many like books and books just on the sexuation. Crazy. If, if, if you have any that you think are, are worth reading, would you, uh, would you mention them in the Sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. Jean yeah. also very early um, realized that there's uh, a strong isomorphism um, between uh, this stuff. Um, I think it was in tarrying with the negative. Uh, he uses some examples from opera, uh, some highly gendered examples from opera, and tries to line them up with uh, with consistent completeness, uh, consistent incompleteness, and consistency. It's really kind well, of. What they know is 
the one thing they always consider is that the axioms of set theory themselves are axioms because you decide that you're going to use them. And if they lead to paradoxes or inconsistencies, then you don't use them. So it's the axioms themselves that are the inconsistency starting point for Baidu. As going back to the previous comment, if there is no consistency proper, uh, there's oneness as he makes the reference in being an event and at the Lacanian sense. But strictly speaking, nothing holds anything together. Like that's the whole point of having a void is that everything is founded on a void, which is that nothing belongs to the to, to set. Sure, and being in nothingness, especially, uh, you have almost a nominalist division with respect to unity, right? There is no one that accounts. You said being in nothingness, are you referring to Sartre? Or? I'm, I'm sorry, <laughs> in being an event. Uh, no. there's, almost, there's almost a nominalist division uh, concerning unity, um, where the one is the retroaction of the effect of the count of one, right? Yes. Um, I don't think that'll work, um, and so I have a tendency to read it out of my appreciation of Badiou. Um, Thank you for reminding us of it. It's, it's, uh, it's not fair for me to leave it out. Um, of course, uh, what, what I think is the exaggerated dismissal of the one at the beginning uh, returns in the form of the hyper one, uh, the hyper one of the self-membered event, right? Um, so in a certain sense, I think we could have done a slightly more moderate distribution of the one and the many at the beginning, um, but this way is certainly more dramatic. Yeah, so the one thing that's interesting in this conversation about Badu and formalism is that, yes, he has a tenuous relationship with what might be called logical positivism or any type of analytic philosophy. I think Badu gets to the point where he, you can actually just accept Badu if you reject the event, meaning uh, it's just strictly constructivist. Uh, let's go back to the example of dogs. You can have a set of dogs and you can have a set of subsets of dog breeds. But then the question also becomes when they invent new dog breeds, what do you call them? What do you name them, right? Because it's not a German Shepherd, but it's not a Greyhound. What, what is it some sort of new set of dog breed? And that's my sort of issue with logical positivism is that it never knows how to name anything new in the situation. And so like I said, Badu, if you take him just to the point of the event where ontology actually doesn't have anything to say about the event, you can riff off the knowledge of, an, of the encyclopedia all you want. And you can get that the same thing with language games and all the sorts of things that he implicates with just being qua constructivist knowledge of thought. Once you get to the event, and like you were saying, it's it's it effectively is Russell's paradox. You're just saying there's a paradoxical multiple in the situation. Does it or doesn't it belong? And that's the point where a subject has to come into play, which is why going back to the comment I made at the beginning about the Turing machine, the Turing machine is not a subject. Sure. Um, it's very important that we try to be precise about whether the multiple actually is paradoxical or whether it is paradoxical on the assumption that the world of the situation is closed to begin with. There, and, Badu's language is paradoxical multiple. Yes, in, in being an event, yes. Um, here, I, th I, I think that doesn't make sense. And here there is some moderation of that language. Uh, which will be interesting to point out uh, when we get to it. Uh, th there's a fine line, I think you're exactly right, between saying uh, the event is a paradoxical multiple or the event is a paradoxical multiple for a situation, uh, which isn't actually structured, uh, which isn't exactly the whole that it presents itself as being. Um, and in, in being an event, um, if you were to make that really clear, it's not clear then why the event couldn't uh, be as, on, as ontological as anything else, uh, why it actually has to suspend uh, ontology. Uh, so I'm, I'm, foundation. I'm sorry? Axiom of foundation. Yeah, the axiom of foundation, though, is uh, not very functional uh, in set theory. It really doesn't make a difference whether you have it or not. Um, some people explored uh, early on with uh, that do uh, whether, well, just by pursuing quote unquote non well founded set theory. Um, we could get this big alternative to Badu. The problem is that um, the math is only trivially different. Um, it just amounts to renaming some things. Uh, so whether you, uh, the, the axiom of foundation was really a kind of overreaction, I think, uh, to the paradoxes that coexists with the uh, 
more fundamental reaction to the paradoxes, which is to proceed axiomatically. You don't really need both. You don't uh, deeply need uh, to worry about explicitly prohibiting self-membership if you also have an axiomatic approach, as far as I know. <clears throat> um, but th there were like three other things uh, that came up in that very rich remark. remark. Um, I'm losing them, I'm sorry. Oh, uh, just, to, just to go back for one second uh, to the possibility of a, of a more moderated distribution of the one in the multiple. One could have said, for instance, something that actually strikes me as very platonic, um, that the one is not, but there are ones, plural. That's not the same thing as saying that ones are the effect of a count as one. That would be overkill in that way. Uh, you might say with Plato that every form is one in its own way, but that there isn't a form of forms that explains the oneness that they all have in common. And uh, it's important to me because of this idea about diagonalization and the good, and that he was going to do uh, his version of it very explicitly at the end. Uh, he's going to talk about how the form of the good is not a form. Um, I prefer to say the form of the good is that there is not a form of forms. Um, but that's probably in our small well, differences. I have maybe two questions. The, 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 so the, the first one um, is kind of going off of what you guys were just going about, going on about about the uh, what, what do you call it? the inconsistent multiple, um, right? That that is a member of itself and. Um, Specifically, the notion of oneness that corresponds to that, and also the other notion of oneness that maybe we're still left with in this perspective, which is V, right? Even though it's not a set, you mentioned that we're like kind of riding on this edge. And this is something that like, I don't know, in my own mathematical education is always very tenuous when they mention you, you I mean, you, you get into set theory and they say, okay, you can say that there is a class of all sets and then they usually just leave it at it's a class it's not a set don't worry about it don't think about it too hard right except for like some large cardinal people um but in terms of those two notions of oneness which we're like still left with if we're going to accept like the very uh, broad the one is not proposition um i'm wondering if there's a relation between the two um something more on like the philosophy side, right? I come from a more mathematical background, so I'm always gonna start with that stuff. Um, I'm curious just what you think about the relation of those two concepts. I'm not sure if they are directly related off the top of my head. At least. And the question I would ask is, is there a count as one operation that could count as one all the sets of or classes of V, however you wanna put it that way? Cause that, that would be the question because the, the, the move from inconsistent multiplicity to a consistent set uh, you know, how many blades of grass are in a field, right? You could count literally every blade of grass and then you could come up with a consistent number. Uh, but that's always a, an operation for Badu. It's never a substance. It's never anything that exists outside of its own vanishing. Um, so the, the oneness as a retroactive effect, retroactively level multiplicity, uh, it's the count as one operation. So yeah, that's the way I would think about that. What do you think? Even if, even if we're moving away from the opening pages of being an event where that line is strongest, um, it still seems clear uh, that there cannot be anything that counts V, the set theoretic universe, the class of all sets, whatever, as one consistently. So I, I was inclined to this, uh, to this modal language before, and I'm not sure how much it helps. I'm really undecided about this. That if you try to count it as one, it would be inconsistent. Does that mean that we should say it is inconsistent in its being uh, to begin with? Well, in the really, really early parts of being an event, that just seems to say so, right? Because inconsistent multiplicity, uh, which uh, there are two related uh, uses of terms like this. One of them refers to the event. Uh, which comes much later, uh, but there's also this bubbling chaos of, uh, 
of inconsistent multiplicity, um, which is being per se before it ha before there's any effect of a count as one in being an event. It's like one of these uh, primal Babylonian creation myths, right? Where where uh, the empty set Marduk has to has to slay the water dragon of <laughs> inconsistent multiplicity in order for there to be a world. Pardon me. Um, uh, right. Um, the rhetorical strategy, so this rhetorical strategy, or which we might also call poetic or metaphorical, and there's a really um, stringent, or we might say brutal, uh, uh, strategy of formalization here. And I know you're familiar with the latter. The former is probably, might be a little new to you here. It's that talk of place, that infernal talk of place. Talking of the as the place of all sets, and we really need to to chase that farther um, next time and, and throughout the book. Um, uh, what is that? Just on that quick note, theory of the subject. Are you, do you think it's a space of placement? What he was calling space. I do not consider myself qualified to say. Um, or even qualified to take a position on how um, how theory of the subject hangs together. I know it really has its partisans. Um, I I don't. I think we're being asked to be quieter. We have to leave in ten minutes. Okay, because they're closing the library. Okay. Um, uh, can you just ask a question quickly? I apologize for, for cutting in. Can I, can I just uh, give the yes, non -poetic? I'm so sorry. Go ahead. No, no, no. Uh, so metaphorically or poetically, we have this talk of place, right? And then we have sort of the root notational answer. Oh, well, a proper class is something that can only show up on the right side of the element relation and never on the left side, as though notational irreversibility solves all of our problems there. And there, uh, to give the Prince of Darkness his due, I think we have to say that Grand Priest is somewhat persuasive that we are uh, being slightly dishonest with ourselves there. Uh, that if we are thinking of, of it as one, we're thinking of it as one. And if we're thinking of it as a paradoxical one, so be it. Uh, but we can't. Uh, come up to the, the point of thinking of it as one and then rely on this uh, notational trick in order to keep the paradox at bay. I think, and I want to argue uh, in the course of this reading, that we have with large cardinals a rejoinder to that, that we actually have a large cardinal rejoinder to dialetheism, uh, which if you accept the revision will be a large cardinal rejoinder to ontotheology available here. Um, but uh, I apologize, Shulman. I, I'm very mixed up today. Um, I apologize. Um, I just wanted to ask a question. This is kind of zooming out a little bit um, about the equation at the beginning of being an event, um, namely ontology is mathematics, right? And um, but you said recently in the Prague conference, the axiomatic circle conference, um, that that was like a joke or a prank. <laughs> uh, and I guess I like, I don't know. I'm not sure how I feel about that because um, I can't tell if he's like pulling our leg again by saying that it was a joke when actually he meant it all along or whether it really was a joke or I, I don't know what to think about it. I only have, I only have two even remotely plausible things. Uh, no, they're not even plausible. I, it only causes me to think two things, and then I uh, will run out of the library before they lock me in. Um, one, no, I have three. <clears throat> one, um, at, at minimum, uh, grant me that ontology is mathematics is one of these uber paradigmatic for Turing type thesis phrases, right? So the general problem about those certainly applies to this. Two, the non errs. And three, diagonalization is always structured like a joke. So it's easy to see in the Gödel sentence 
uh, the diagonalization is like a joke, um, but it's even true in Condor's theorem, and we can uh, we can tease that out more later. I really apologize; um, they are going to be cross with me. These are summer hours, um, so there are limits apparently. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much, you. John. Looking forward to next week. See ya.